I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. When you think of the Republic of Ireland, you probably think of a nation of pious Catholics. Well, think again. Free Thought Matters will be back in a minute with our guest, Michael Nugent, founder and chairperson of Atheist Ireland. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. The Republic of Ireland brings to mind emerald green scenery and stories of leprechauns and, and poets and St. Patrick's and when we think of the, like the Magdalene sisters and a country enthralled to the Pope, and we think about a lot of Irish priests and all that. But we have a guest today who will surprise you about the growing secularism in Ireland. Michael Nugent is a writer of both serious and comedy material who lives in Dublin. He's a founder and chairperson of the advocacy group Atheist Ireland which promotes atheism, reason, and ethical secularism in Ireland and around the world. Michael Nugent has campaigned against terrorism in Northern Ireland. He also champions the right to assisted dying for terminally or seriously ill people. If Michael has a motto, it would be, you have rights, your beliefs do not. That's great. So Michael, thanks for joining us today. You're um, welcome. It's, it's great to be here. Great to have you. So what do you mean, mean by saying you have rights and your beliefs do not? Well, we operate on the basis of human rights principles to promote secularism. We promote atheism among the population because we believe that atheism is a more reliable worldview than faith. But when we're dealing with the political system, we don't promote atheism. We promote secularism. We promote separation of church and state. And on that basis, what we're saying is that the state should respect everybody's right to hold whatever beliefs they want uh, and to express their beliefs as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others. But that what we have to respect is the people, not their beliefs. We can respect their right to hold the beliefs, but we don't have to respect the content of the beliefs. And indeed, we should criticise robustly beliefs that are either untrue or harmful. And the Venice Commission which is a body of the Council of Europe that uh, advises governments on constitutional matters, makes that point very strongly. It's, it says that we, we must be allowed under human rights law to criticise, criticise beliefs, including religious beliefs, even unreasonably and even harshly, and even if it hurts people's feelings, and that the response of society to people who are hurt, whose feelings are hurt by their beliefs being criticised, is we should try to raise their their levels of, of 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 insensitivity to criticism rather than capitulating to people saying you can't criticise the content of our beliefs just because it hurts us. So well, Ireland used to have a blasphemy law, didn't it? It used to have worse than a blasphemy law. Ireland was when I grew up in a, as as a child and as a teenager, it was an effective theocracy. The Catholic Church ruled the country uh, de facto. It, it probably peaked in 1979 when Pope John Paul visited Ireland and a million people came to a mass in the Phoenix Park. Uh, he then went on to other places. He went to, to Drogheda, another huge crowd. He went to Galway and held a youth mass where he was introduced by two priests 
Um, uh, one was Bishop Eamon Casey, who was a very popular and powerful bishop at the time. Another was Father Michael Cleary, who was a kind of hardline but populist uh, Catholic priest. Nobody knew at the time that both of those uh, cheerleaders or support acts for, for the Pope, both of them had secretly fathered children with vulnerable women. Uh, One of them, Bishop Eamon Casey, was taking money from the parish to pay for that child. Um, the, the, just absolutely scandalous hypocrisy. Uh, uh, and, and, and yet, that is what the people of Ireland <coughs> rallied around. Up until, I would say, the 90s is, is, is probably when it started to change. In, in the 80s, we had a very significant cha uh, uh, change, which is probably... The, the last hurrah of the Catholic Church's power here, where, where they brought in uh, a, a constitutional referendum to make abortion, which was already unlawful, but to make it unconstitutional. Because they were afraid, after Roe versus Wade in America, they were afraid that the courts here might possibly make abortion legal on the same basis through, through the law, and they wanted to make sure that the judges didn't have the power to do that. So that's going back to probably the, 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 the early 80s, and, and maybe a decade after that, when there was another referendum to try to, to legalise divorce and that referendum was uh, was defeated. So divorce was still unconstitutional. So that, that brings us up to the, to the, to the 90s. So, so that, but that, that's probably the peak of their power. Since then, Ireland has become gradually more secular. And, the, and we're now at a stage where what used to be a Catholic country is now effectively a pluralist country, but still with Catholic laws that were put in place when the Catholic Church did have control over the population and are bolstered by a constitution that uh, uh, was put in place in 1937 and, and which makes it the, the constitution a very Catholic one. So, so that's part of the reason for the delays in changing things is we have to, to kind of gradually have a series of referendums to remove the obstacles uh, uh, to, to uh, then enable the, the laws to become more secular. Well, so let's hop over to those referenda. Uh, um, I, I believe that the uh, Republic of Ireland was the first nation in the world where the people voted in favor of marriage equality. Isn't that right? Yes, it's, it's an amazing change uh, they, that, that, that from, from a, a, a country where as, as late as, as the 1980s and, and 90s, we, we, were, we had a case where, where one of our senators, Senator David Norris, uh, who is, was the first gay um, elected public representative in Ireland, before he was a public representative back in the 70s, he took a legal case against uh, the, the, uh, the illegality of uh, homosexual relationships in Ireland. And he lost that case. And, and the court said that the reason was because uh, because homosexuality had always been considered evil, including in the Bible. And, wow. and that the Constitution could not possibly have envisaged something like that being, being, being legal. He eventually took his court or his case to the European Court of Human Rights and he won there. And so the, the Irish state then had to make uh, homosexuality lawful in Ireland. But, but only a few short decades from that, we're now in a case where, where, where being gay is not only accepted as just a normal part of life, but we have changed the constitution to enable uh, same-sex marriage on the same status as, as uh, what was considered traditional marriage in Ireland before that. And then equally amazing and wonderful is the referendum that passed to legalise uh, abortion. Probably the most significant cultural change in, in Ireland or, or certainly a validation of a cultural change that had already happened in, in Ireland in my lifetime. Uh, we had, a, a, as I say, abortion was always illegal. It was made unconstitutional in 1983. Back then, when, when the referendum was happening to make uh, abortion unconstitutional, things were so bad that even feminists who are campaigning against that amendment in the constitution felt unable to openly say they were supporting the right to abortion. They yeah. were they were merely saying, uh, or we were merely saying, because I was involved in those campaigns, or we're, were merely saying that that the, the wording of the con of, of the proposed amendment wouldn't do what it was intended to do, and it was it was a, it was a futile attempt to to uh, to try to to change things. So. We've now moved from that where where we where, where uh, we've had 
Now, now tragically, I, I have to put this in, in, in context. Uh, I've always, I always feel that the way society changes is not by campaigns, by activists such as us. I think we contribute towards it. But what typically happens, I think, is just something happens that changes the way people look at things. And then all of our work becomes retrospectively helpful. And in Ireland, with regards to abortion, they, they, what happened that, that made that, that change was, was a woman called Savita Halapanavar, uh, who was in hospital and uh, had uh, and wanted an abortion, but wasn't given the abortion because the fetus still had a heartbeat, even though doctors accepted that the pregnancy was unviable. Um, so so she, she was essentially left without an abortion, got septicemia and died. And her death was unnecessary. Her death was brought about because of our political situation in Ireland. And her husband was told by the doctors in the hospital that the reason that she couldn't have an abortion was because this is a Catholic country. Mm. And once that story broke, suddenly just everybody knew that the position was unsustainable of maintaining the ban on abortion. And, and gradually it came to the stage where, where, where we had the um, that, that re referendum. And, and, we and interject that this was, I mean, yeah. this is very recent. We had visited oh, yeah. Ireland before she died and then right after. It was an international incident. Yeah, we all was, heard of it. That was in Galway, right? In Galway. And when, yes. when was that yeah. referendum? It was just a few years ago. Yeah, it was 2018, I think. I'm losing track of time yeah. with some referendums, but it's certainly within that, that time scale. You at Atheist Ireland, uh, after our conference there, took us to a fundraiser in a bar to raise money for abortion funds that were helping to pay for Irish women uh, to their transportation to over go to over England. to England so they could get abortions. Yeah, and, and it's one of the things, one of the earlier things that... that, that that shifted things towards accepting the need for abortion is when the referendum took place in the 1980s, it was kind of accepted by everybody because Ireland is, 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 ha, has traditionally been very much a hypocritical nod and wink society with regards to the, these issues. It was accepted that people would go to England to have abortions. And everyone knew that that was happening and nobody was trying to stop that from happening. And in the 1990s, a, a middle-aged man raped a, a young teenage girl uh, in his neighbourhood. Uh, her parents brought her to England to, to have an abortion and they wanted to check with the police in Ireland whether DNA from the fetus could be used in the legal case against the uh, man who had raped her. And the response of the Irish state was to take an injunction against the girl preventing her from leaving the country to have an abortion because it was against the constitution. Mm. And again, that outraged people. And, and the, the courts got around it by putting in place a, by a, a weird interpretation of the amendment saying that, that if um, that, that, that the, 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 there's an equal right to life of the mother and that if, if the mother, as it's phrased, is, um, is suicidal, that that counts as a threat to her life, and in this case, the, the teenage girl was suicidal. So was again, we've got all of this kind of, abortion. She, she was as, as it happened. She ended up miscarrying. But 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 the the again, these things. It, it's absolutely horrific. We, we, yes. You can almost forget when you're talking about the political issues that you're talking about. You know, personal tragedies in people's lives, and and, and in this case, a, you know, a young girl who was completely traumatised. So so you have that and then you have the Savita Alapanabar uh, as, as, as the, you know, the, the, the two things that eventually tip things over the edge. But but now it's, it's, it's accepted. Uh, and, you know, nobody, re really even the Catholic Church realises that, that, that they've lost control on, on, on issues like that. Wow. Um, as, as, you know, so, so it, it's, it's a very, very positive move. And then, of course, the same year, we then had another referendum to remove the offence of blasphemy from the Constitution. Oh. And so that's three referendums in a row, marriage equality, abortion and blasphemy. And the significance of those three referendums is that all three of them, we won them by about a two to one majority. Oh. So there's a pattern right now. Yes. It's, it's, it's now clear that, that the, the, there's a consistent majority in favour of, of liberal, compassionate, human rights based approaches to, well, to these issues that were once controlled by the Catholic Church. So we're going to take a break. We're talking with Michael Nugent, a founder of Atheist Ireland. And after the break, Michael, we want to ask you about some of the activities of 
Atheist Ireland and about the changes in demographics in your once very Catholic country. We'll be right back with more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name's Katie, and I'm an out-of-the-closet freethinker. I decided to shed religion because of its self-destructive tendencies. I witnessed firsthand the toll religion can take on your psyche as a Christian woman. I grew up judging people, proselytizing, and ridiculing them because their beliefs didn't coincide with mine. And let me tell you, if someone were to question my faith, I would not have any of it. It wasn't until I was working at a Christian camp that I met an atheist, and he taught me to think critically and view the world through a different lens. It was at this moment that I decided that I may never have been a believer. A sense of fear and community were really the only things holding me to my faith. As a proud woman and humanitarian, I would like to be the best version of myself, not the worst. We're talking with Atheist Ireland Chair Michael Nugent about the great strides in the Republic of Ireland in getting religious dogma out of its laws. And Michael, uh, what prompted the founding of Atheist Ireland in the first place? Well, initially it was just uh, an online discussion forum called atheist.ie, where Irish atheists were discussing things uh, among ourselves. And then we decided in 2008 to turn it into a real life advocacy group and to campaign to promote atheism among, among the population and secularism among the politicians. And so, so we were starting from a very low base. I mean, one of the first things that we had to do was just normalize the use of the word atheist, which was typically used not at all in the, in the Dáil, and when it, which is our parliament, and when it was, was kind of almost used as a joke or an insult. But we've now reached a stage where politicians routinely refer to Atheist Ireland in terms of submissions that, that would put on policy that we make when they're debating issues where we outline the, the secular implications of laws and so on. And we are now effectively part of the political agenda. So we're very, we're very pleased with that. And the, the main things that we campaign on are issues like the, well, we, we, we've got rid of the uh, abortion ban We've got rid of the the, the ban on blasphemy. We've got rid of the, the marriage equality. I, I should I, I should stress on two of those, the abortion issue and the marriage equality. They're not solely atheist Ireland issues. We were part of larger coalitions, and those changes would have happened anyway, even if atheist Ireland didn't exist. But with regard to the blasphemy ban, I think it's safe to say that without atheist Ireland, that referendum wouldn't have even happened. Never mind being carried. So that's probably our our, our biggest achievement to date as an organisation is removing the ban on blasphemy, which, although it's a silly law, is also a very dangerous law because Islamic states at the United Nations were citing the Irish blasphemy law as what they wanted implemented around the world because they were delighted to have a, a modern Western state, uh, you know, having a blasphemy law that, that, that they could point to. So apart from that, the, the, the other main issues that we're focusing on now are the education system, 90% of our primary schools still controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. There are religious oaths in our constitution where in order to be a president or a judge, or a member of the Council of State, which includes our Prime Minister, you have to swear a religious oath to take those offices. And uh, and that there are also other issues with regard to, say, marriage, solemnising, things like that, 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 that we're, we're dealing with as well. Well, if I can borrow a word, your group is very inspiring to groups like ours. That You're not just sitting around talking. 
you're actually doing things. I, you know, we visited you a few times, and you have these tables out by that famous post office, passing out literature and at, at advocating for change. So, congratulations for all of that. But I want to ask, um, and still in the back of my brain, I think of Ireland as this Catholic country, but it's really not anymore. There's there's a lot more seculars. Uh, do you know the breakdown now? What are the changes in demographics in, just in the last few years? Well, the last census officially. And this is an, an oversimplification, but officially 80% of people say they're Roman Catholic, although in practice they're not. In practice, they're, 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 there's a leading census question that inflates the number of, of, of religious figures. I'll come back to that in a second. The other is there, of the other 20%, there are marginally more non religious than there are all of the other minority faiths combined. So non-religious is the second largest demographic in Ireland after Roman Catholicism. Now, if we go back to that theoretical 80% figure of Roman Catholics, slightly under 80%, that's just the official figure. Everyone knows it's not real. Everyone knows that people in the census just put down the, the religion that they were born into rather than the uh, their, their, their actual practices today. There was a survey a few years ago conducted at the, um, the Catholic International Eucharistic Congress in Dublin, uh, like a proper market research survey rather than just an, a, an opinion poll. And it found that 75% um, of Irish Roman Catholics don't believe in transubstantiation, which is one of the key elements of Roman Catholicism. Half of them don't believe in hell. 15% of them don't believe Jesus was the son of God. And my personal favourite is that 8% of Irish Roman Catholics don't believe in God, oh. which you would think <laughs> would be a fairly low hurdle for being a Roman Catholic. So, so in practice, I think most Irish Roman Catholics are at best Protestants, and probably a lot of them are atheists. So what, what about you? What was your background? Well, my family were what I would call cultural Catholics. You know, they, they uh, went to church and they brought me and my siblings to church, but they told us once they brought us, look, w once you grow up, make up your own mind what you want to believe in. They were, they were very liberal. They, they, they were on the, on the right side. Well, I suppose that's uh, just pre my prejudice. They were on the same side as we are on the, on the, on the social issues of the day. So they, so they believed, um, my, I'd say my mother believed in God, but she didn't believe in, in, in the Catholic Church. And my father was uh, effectively an atheist, although I think he would have described himself as an agnostic. Like he was a very philosophical person who, who just recognised that it was extremely unlikely that, that this, uh, this God thing existed. But, but, but it, it wasn't an important enough issue for him to say to campaign on or whatever. He, would just, he was just get, you know, getting on with, the, with his life. Well, but, there's so that did you, I'm sorry, did you, did you go from ever believing then or did you just never really, it never really took? Well, when I was a child, I remember in primary school, we were uh, given uh, a project to do over the Easter holidays where we had to uh, read the Gospels and rewrite them in our own words. And I remember spending ages doing that. So we, we had these old style copy books with a space on the top to draw pictures and then lines underneath to write things. So I was drawing pictures of the Jesus stories and writing the story. And halfway through it, it kind of dawned on me because I, I used to read a lot of comic books at the time. And it's only me that this Jesus character was like, you know, a Marvel superhero, uh, you know, who had these all these powers, you know, and 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 he was um, like 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 Superman. His father sent him to Earth, you mm. know, and, like Spider Man. He had great powers, and he had to uh, deal with yeah. them ethically. And you know, so so I kind of felt from then on that this is just a cartoon character from antiquity. I was going to say, there's that old joke that a lot of Catholics don't believe in God, but they do believe that Mary was his mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary's been a big thing, of course, in Ireland. Uh, the, you know, statues of, of Mary all over the place. And, and there, there was a very funny uh, bit of, of, of uh, craziness back in the 1980s where, where there was a statue of um, uh, their lady in, in, outside, in a place called Balna Smithle outside Cork that people thought that they had seen moving. And it, we, there was just thousands of people going to watch this statue to see if it was moving. You, you took us yeah, to see that. Extraordinary. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. And it was just. But, but my favourite part of that was was when uh, some. It wasn't actually atheists. It was it was some fundamentalist evangelicals uh, attached the statue um, because uh, they d didn't have the, the, the same beliefs about Mary. And uh, so they attacked the statue with, with hammers. And and uh, I remember somebody saying at the time, "Why didn't she duck?" Yeah. 
So, Michael, I would be curious about your take on the pandemic. And, well, I'd like to know, is there a backlash against vaccines or masking? Do, we, do you have any of these same problems that we have in the United States? Not really. I mean, there, there is a small vocal minority, but by and large, you, you know, the population is going with the science and the population is being as responsible as, as we can. Uh, the vast majority of people uh, are vaccinated. I'm sorry, I'm double vaccinated. Most people are double vaccinated. Now, that, that we're kind of in a strange situation at the moment where we're trying to move out of it and, and the politicians are, I think, being a little bit too hasty. They're reopening things like nightclubs, um, which I think is, is, is a bit irresponsible. Um, but, but, but by and large, I, th I think the population of, of Ireland has, has approached the issue very responsibly. So we only have about a minute left. I don't think we have time to go into it, but I imagine that secular parents and children do face problems in Ireland because 90% of the schools are run by the Catholic Church. Yes, it's it's an issue. Maybe at some stage you might like to bring on Jane Donnelly to talk to to you about because she's our human rights officer who deals with that issue. The the it, it's a hangover from the the old laws that that the, our, the Catholic Church still runs ninety percent of our primary schools and has exemptions in our equality laws that allows them to discriminate on the grounds of religion. And that's probably the biggest of the issues that we still have to change in terms of secularizing our laws. Well, you have done phenomenally um, in a short time with Atheist Ireland uh, in. It is an, a secular inspiration, including internationally, to us, on... where we are dealing with, you know, losing abortion rights in, in front of our eyes. So, um, uh, well done, Michael and Atheist Ireland. Thank you very much. And, and can, I, can I just finish by saying that, that by reciprocating that feeling, when we were starting off and we were looking around at atheist and secular groups around the world, Freedom from Religion Foundation was, was one of the groups that inspired us. Well, that's good to hear. Well, thank you. Michael Nugent is the founder, a founder and chair of Atheist Ireland. So thank you so much for joining us, Michael. You're welcome. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots. Help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers.